book of Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 1. Proverbs chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Our topic for this evening, a special religious liberty topic, is building a case against the papacy in a digital age. Building a case against the papacy in a digital age. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. As we turn to Proverbs 5 and verse 1, I'd like to just give an idea, a thumbnail of what we're looking at and what this title really means in prophetic, Protestant, and religious liberty lines as we open up the Bible and take a look at this topic this evening. The title is Building a Case Against the Papacy in a Digital Age. Many of us here have heard numerous prophetic studies on Revelation 13, Revelation 17, Daniel 11, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. We've heard many, many studies dealing with the rise, the power, and the prophetic end of the power we know as the papal power. We're familiar with the scripture, we're familiar with the, the outlines, the, the prophetic and also the, the systematic text by text identifying of this end time power and its role and how it finally will end. <clears throat> Yet when we look at this power, we understand that the word of God has shown us that even though this power has existed for millennia, we can't always prosecute the, the war against error, the war against injustice, intolerance, religious persecution, genocide, and all the various things we're going to talk about tonight, in the same way exactly the pioneers did, or even the reformers <coughs> did. Now, I don't think I'm going some kind of heretical idea of new life. We're not dealing with that. But again, we understand we're living in a digital age. We're not living in the dark age. We're not living in the time of the 18th century or even the early 19th century. We're living in a new era of time. And when we look at Proverbs 5 and verse 1, let's see if this scripture speaks to us and shows that when we talk about the fulfillment of the book Great Controversy, page 606, you're familiar with that. I'm sure you all have read the book Great Controversy many times. You know the Great Controversy 606 says that the sins of Babylon will be what? Laid open or unmasked. There will be a people to do that. But I wonder if using the methods, using quotations that only deal with scripture, using issues that aren't properly calculated to deal with a digital age of the beast, if we'll be able to really prosecute this, this gospel work and fulfill this prophecy of Great Controversy 606 if we don't understand how to build a case against the papacy in this digital age. An age where the Pontifex Maximus has a Twitter page with millions of followers, one of the largest followings on the internet is held by the papacy, a digital age where the papacy under numerous popes have had more covers on Time magazine than some presidents. The words of Revelation 13 are being fulfilled where it says that all the world would wonder after the beast. In the dark ages, yes, you had a time of great darkness, but this is a great time of light. It's not a time where the books of the Bible are being hid in Latin. They're being hid among multiplicitous translations. At one time, there was only one Bible, but it was written in Latin, so you couldn't really read it unless you knew Latin. Now it's in all languages, even Ebonics. Ebonics now. And with thousands, let's say hundreds of different translations, so that among all these translations, which would you choose? The chances of you choosing the right Bible in this age of so much light seems unlikely. With a Ebonics Bible and a street slang Bible, the gangster Bible, the, the Queen James Bible, you follow me? By deluging the earth with translations by scholars, many Catholics so-called, the world has plunged itself again to darkness in the age of digital technology. But we're talking about how to build a case in this playing field against the papacy, where when we talk about the prophetic standards and the scripture, they don't change. 
We talk about the identifying marks of Revelation 13 and 17 and so on. They don't change. But we understand that in this time, because we have allowed the powers that be and the issues that we're going to talk about tonight to steal a march upon us, to present those things in many people's eyes, both liberal and conservative, is hate speech. It's to speak against a certain class of people and to denigrate them, to speak ill of them. And it's becoming largely illegal. The idea of freedom of speech, even by those that hate certain races, like we've seen in the news, people that have hate, even to the point of killing certain people, have the right to speak. Do they not? Is freedom of speech a right? Are there limits to freedom of speech? Are there limits? No. Well, there are no limits? Uh, are there limits? Uh, that means that there's no law, there's no limits, right? Because li law intimates there's some type of limits. Well, again, we can, even though there are, there's a presumed idea that you cannot speak against certain classes, you have a right to dissent. You have to make sure that your right, and I might be deviating from our topic tonight, but you have to make sure your right to dissent is not based upon ill will, malice, hatred. It must be built upon fact and evidence and, if you want to use the term, the rule of law. The rule of law. We don't want to deviate from our topic. So when we talk about hate speech, hate speech is a work in progress now, whereas in the time of the Dark Ages, it was the idea of speaking heresy. Yeah, hate speech today and heresy today. You would be killed, you'd be marginalized, you'd be banished for heresy. Speaking things that were seen as being hateful, like, I don't believe that the way for actually become the blood of Christ. That was heresy, that was, that was punishable by death. I don't believe the Pope is the, the vicar of Christ. That is heresy in the Dark Ages. That would be seen as punishable by death. To say the Pope is the Antichrist will be seen as heresy. But now it's called what? Hate speech. How do we build a case against the man of sin or the papal power in this digital, hostile age? Can I share something with you in Proverbs 5? Proverbs 5 says this. Let's get some scripture inside here to see if we can make some sense out of this idea that there is a a unchanging biblical pattern, a template that we must show from the Word of God to show who this prophetic person or power is that will rule for 1260 days or time, time and a half, that will wear out the saints, that will be antichrist, he'll sit in the temple of God. We see and know all the, the scriptures, don't we? But notice what it says in Proverbs 5 to show that we, even though we understand these things, don't believe that the way that the papacy, who does not change, in her principles, presents herself to the world. The papacy that's being wondered at in our modern age is not the understanding or the face or the view of the papacy that was in the dark ages. In Proverbs 5 it says this, we know that prophetically a woman represents what? And an impure woman or evil or malicious woman represents a impure church or apostate church. And among all churches, a mother church that represents this same power in the last days. We know that. And Proverbs 5 and 1 says this. It says, My son, attend to my wisdom, and bow thine ears to my understanding, thou, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an... Her words are sweet. They are pleasing. And her mouth is smoother than... Oil, the words that's the, her ability to explain her position or explain away her evil, explain away her genocide, explain away her human rights violation, explain her persecution, explain her, her, her animus for religious liberty. It can be talked away so clear, so smoothly. It says, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of hell. hell. Notice verse 6. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are that thou canst not know. What does that mean? 
lest thou should ponder the way of life, lest your mind could be drawn back to the principle of God's word and the righteousness there, the heavenly sanctuary rather than the Vatican, the true high priest rather than the Pope. Amen? Amen. The priesthood of all believers rather than the Roman priesthood per se. The intercession that we have with Christ to hear all our sins between God and man directly rather than the confessional, lest you should be able to ponder the ways of life, it says, her ways are movable. movable. Your margin may say unstable. Another, if you look at the Hebrew, it says also her ways are changeable. She is a chameleon. That thou canst not know them. So in other words, when we talk about the paper power and we try to build a case, most people try and build a case against what the average mind today would say, the digital mind today would say, is a church that existed a thousand years ago. Oh, look at the Dark Ages and what they did in the Dark Ages. Oh, that was a thousand years ago. That was the medieval church. Oh, they did the, look at what they said about the Sabbath. Oh, well, that was a hundred years ago. The papacy includes all religions. They have a spirit of ecumenism. All religions are coming together as one. Ever heard that? Oh, did you know that the papacy was involved in, in many atrocities of the Dark Ages? Even to the, a couple, maybe a hundred, two hundred years ago, there were atrocities by the Catholic Church. Oh, well, they've apologized. They've apologized. And how dare you bring these things back up when they have not only apologized, they've done many good works with their hospitals, with their humanitarian aid and so on, to show that they are not the Church of Dark Ages. We can't hold them accountable for those things. This is a completely different era. This is a digital age. This is the age of enlightenment. How can you judge and make judgment on the church using the Bible that existed so long ago. Even people will say, well, you know what? You know, you gotta be careful because, you know, the papacy is respected. The papacy is a recognized state. It has ambassadors and so on. And Many, almost all countries of the world, and many individuals have ambassadors that are recognized and working directly with Rome. But we want to talk about that. We want to talk about that because, uh, for your notes, write down Great Controversy 566. Because many of the arguments I've shared with you, just in a few seconds here, are often cited by people in our own church. Not just the, the average Protestant, so called Protestant today, because the Pope has said Protestantism is over, right? The protest is over. This is his words. And should it not be, and would it not be if the majority of Protestants say things like that and believe like that? Some of these arguments I've presented, many Protestants put forth, ministers, seminarians, theologians. But these things are said even among us. There's an idea that some of the things that are seen in the book, Great Controversy, are a result of 18th century anti-Catholicism. And we don't believe those things anymore. The, the, the spirit of anti-Catholicism was rife, they say, back there. It was everywhere. And it infected and affected the theology of Seventh-day Adventists. But, but since that time, we have grown as a church. We have broadened our understanding of the body of Christ. We have embraced the brotherhood and sisterhood of churches. You ever hear things like that? And the question would come to your mind, how can we build a case against the papacy in the digital age when from within and without, the whole idea of who the papacy is, what its role is, what its standing is today, seems to be different. Her ways are movable. So that, what it says in verse 6, thou cannot know them. If you don't know where something is, can you hit it? If you don't know where something is, can you go there? Can you expose something you don't know where it is or what it is? If their ways are movable, changeable, we're using ideas and principles that people see only in the past. And the arguments that we present are not based upon religious liberty, it's based on the Bible alone. Some people don't believe in the Bible alone. Amen? Amen. Does the prophecies only deal with the Bible? Now before you answer, the prophecies have evidence, do they not? 
There's evidence that the Bible has been fulfilled. The promises of the Bible have been fulfilled. And where is the evidence that the Bible, that the Bible promises have been fulfilled? In history books, in secular books, in places, in archaeological sites and digs, in the world, you can find evidence to show that the word of God has come to pass. Babylon has not been rebuilt. Saddam Hussein tried to, has not been rebuilt. The word of God is true from point to point to point, and it's been made true in secular sources. So also when we talk about the papacy and the idea of this anti-Christ power, this end time power, how do we in this last day build a case when we seem, because we only deal with the Bible, a thousand years, five hundred years too late to present any argument against the papacy as a power, a despotic power that will try to remove religious liberty. Again, because we've lost as a people, as Adventist people, as the remnant people, a true understanding of the three this message and have put it down, put it to the side, and taken a new organization view of the three angels, new books of a new order, intellectual philosophy has come in among us. This idea can't really deal with the papacy, because as we love the gospel and the loud voice message that goes with it in the first, second, and third angels message, we also lost the idea of religious liberty. And unless we understand how to present, not only prophetically, not only biblically, not only historically, but from a religious liberty standpoint, this case, this argument against the papacy's legitimacy as a religious and a civil power, as a legitimate force for good in the world, then how can we really build a case against the papacy? We'll seem just as deluded as most people that have hate speech against blacks and Jews and so on and so forth. We'll seem odd, crazy. And because we lack very little evidence of, of, of uh, any intelligent sort, it may seem right to say that. In Great Controversy 566, Great Controversy 566, the servant of the Lord says that the people need to be aroused to resist. Speaking of the papacy, the people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe of civil and religious liberty. I'll repeat that. Great Controversy 566, she says concerning the papacy, the people need to be aroused, not just Protestants, not just Christians, the whole world need to be aroused to resist the advances in the courthouses, in the legislature, in society, in public thinking, on Twitter, of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious Liberty, civil liberties, rights, human rights, as well as religious freedom. Building a case against the papacy in a digital age. Shall we look at three things as we contemplate this? Again, I want to remind you in Great Controversy 606, it says that Babylon still will be laid open. But if those sins aren't sins anymore, what are we laying open? If the papacy has changed, legitimately changed, then is there sins to be laid open? Or are we trying to dig up the sins of those that have repented? Has the papacy repented? No. Now you say no, but she's apologized. Isn't that enough? Isn't a repentance just apologizing? We want to talk about that tonight. Because again, when we talk about building a case against the papacy, we must understand how from a biblical, even religious liberty standpoint, and even a rule of law, what does true repentance mean? Now you say repentance is a religious term. Well, in the secular world, there's also an idea of repentance. Because when you do a crime, you're called not only to have some remorse. That plays into your sentence, does it not? If you're found guilty of a crime, how you, de how you act, a sense of remorse, a sense of acknowledging your guilt... Even apologizing, plain just, it does not remove your sentence, but it plays into it. But also there's something called restitution. And if you are incarcerated for that crime, before you get parole, they look and examine not only your remorse, your apologies, your attempt at restitution, whether it be financial or otherwise, but also they look at something very important called your ability to what's the term? It escapes me. 
it could be called recidivism, but still, your ability to repeat the crime. In other words, if you have apologized, you've done restitution, you've paid your debt to society, you've been a model inmate, you have done everything you can to write books for children, so on, you've done everything to try and undo the fact that you killed little children when you were 10 years old or so on and so forth, and you're older now, it's years have passed, and now the idea that you can get parole, you think it's a good thing because you're a different person. You've changed, you've done restitution, you've apologized, you've done good works, even though you were kind of in prison for so you tried to write books for children and so on, you try to make the world a better place. However, when they come to parole, they found that the same weapons and, and weapons of, of destruction you use to harm those children, you haven't got rid of them. And as a matter of fact, you have been making plans to continue that same enterprise after you were released because you have all the machinery there to do it still. You have paid money, you've done all these things, but still, this very machinery, the very operation by which you perpetrated that crime before is still in place. Would you give that person parole? We're talking about repentance now. Repentance without restitution. Doesn't Jesus say to give restitution? Doesn't he say to make it, make it right? But does he also say to turn away from those things? You can't be repentant and also still plotting the downfall of those that you sin or hurt. So how do we build a case against the papacy in this digital age? These are all principles by which we, from a religious literary standpoint, examine the legitimacy of the papal civil, the papacy's civil and religious stance in the world. The biblical ones are for the Christians. But from a prophetic standpoint, we understand the civil and religious standpoint of who the papacy presents herself as today through Pope Francis, through the Roman Curia, through the papal state, through Vatican II, through her apologies. We're almost done. Number one. Are we still together? Amen. Did I lose you? No. Can you see the importance of, of uh, having this understanding if you're going to be preaching this? In this generation, you have to understand this. We're not living in the 1800s, 1900s, 1960. We're not living in the, the 1400s. We're living in 2017. Where everything is on the internet. And people are very much into freedom of speech, rights, human rights. Number one. Many people don't know that the papacy shares a dual crown. She claims or presumes herself to be a queen or sits as a, a sovereign in religious matters. The mother church, she styles herself. Ever heard that? But also she claims to have also the right as a queen or temporal power also, temporal dominion. And the Vatican has a state. Now those that are students of prophecy and history know that from 538 to 1798, the papacy had universal sway. Is that true? What happened in 1798? What we call the deadly wound, which is basically the, the ambassage of Napoleon in the name of Berthier, the general Berthier, went to Rome and proved to the world that the Pope's claim to civil immunity to prosecution was invalid. The Pope claimed and the Pope held uh, the the sway or the, the standing in the world that because of her religious and civil role as a king, as the king of kings, that she was immune from prosecution. Even to this day, the papacy says that because of her sovereignty and as a state, she's immune from persecution, or sorry, from prosecution. She cannot be taken to court. Because name another entity upon the earth that has all the cases of child molestation and so on that has not been taken to court and, and all that. I mean, can you imagine any entity upon the earth having all these issues and establishing committees to talk about it and then just kind of brush it away and it goes away and it goes on for years and years and years and years. Can you imagine anybody, any entity, any organization, any state having that type of exposure, that kind of scandal and not have some kind of prosecution? But the papacy has. And one of the reasons why is because 
she has a certain inviability because she is, in the eyes of many, a state. The Vatican State is recognized as a state. She has a flag and this whole nine yards. But is she really a state? In 1798, when that deadly wound was given, that deadly wound basically was birth year, showing that the papacy could be touched by international law, could be placed under the jurisdiction of another power, could be penalized for violating international or even the, the law of France. The French took her and put her in, or put the Pope into exile, put her in jail. Now, of course, Pope, Pope still came and went, but the temporal land and power that the papacy had was greatly diminished, and she had lost all her effects and power openly, diplomatically, at state level with nations. You follow that? Not just the Pope going into exile, that was one thing, but also her ability to influence openly, to have state communications and diplomatic relations with other states was removed. Even the property that the Vatican State owned was greatly diminished. Until 1929, when during the Lateran Treaty, Emperor, as he called himself, or dictator Mussolini gave back 108 acres, is it, to the Vatican? Ever read about that? It's called the Lateran Treaty. And this Lateran Treaty basically gave 108 acres, which is basically the, the area around the Vatican Palace, which is basically the Vatican Palace or the, the Vatican, a few buildings and a garden. Now this sits in Rome. We'll come to that in a moment. But when we look at international law, how, how valuable is the Lateran Treaty? Because again, if the papacy is not a legitimate state from a standpoint of civil power, then the ability of her to escape persecution is removed. And the UN must act against what's going on with the papacy just on human rights violations of children. You still with me? Maybe, you, maybe I lost you. There's something called the Montevideo Convention on Rights and Duties of States. It's a matter of international law. International law, they have different conventions, different meetings where they talk about and organize and outline what is and what is not legal and right when it comes to international affairs. And they had a conference in a place called Montevideo where they basically outlined what are the rights and duties of states. State could be America's state, or Secretary of State, right? Uh, Canada, Russia, all these sovereign nations are called nation states. Still with me? Right. These nation states have certain rights and duties, but also there's certain criteria by which you actually are recognized as a legitimate state in international affairs. There's four criteria. And all four criteria, the papacy fails. Even though she's recognized by powers and she has this leeway, it's not legitimate. And according to international law, she should not be and really cannot stand upon the right of a sovereign nation to avoid prosecution. Let's look at some of those four. And again, it's important to understand this when we talk about building a case against the papacy from a religious liberty standpoint and the idea of all the issues that will be thrown against those that dissent her dogmas and her approaching to prophetic fulfillment. I'm just going to understand this. Number one, to be a city-state, which the papacy claims to be by having 108 acres called Vatican City. The first thing that the Montevideo uh, Convention said that you need to have to have a legitimate state is citizens. Citizens. What citizens? Brother Philip here was born in New York, right? Some 20-something years ago. And because he was born here, what magical thing happened as soon as he was born? He was a citizen of the United States of America. Because any legitimate city-state, sovereign state, has what's called citizenship. And when you're born here, you automatically are able to claim. You actually have citizenship. My mother, who's not here tonight, wasn't born here. She was born some 80-something years ago in the state country, nation state of Trinidad and Tobago. But she immigrated to America and became a naturalized 
what's the word? Citizen of the United States. Eventually, a citizen. So, number one, to have a legitimate state, you have to have citizens if you have a country, right? The Vatican City has no citizens. You, if you're born on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica, guess what you are? As soon as that baby comes out of the womb, guess what you are? Italian. You were born in Rome, and you have Italian citizenship. Now, the Vatican City supposedly is a separate nation, is it not? Oh, so that's a presumption. But they have no citizenship. You cannot be born, you cannot have citizenship there. You can't immigrate, immigrate, you can't immigrate or emigrate from the Vatican City. The Vatican City really only exists to do the temporal work of the pontiff and the curia. The curia is his senate, the college of bishops as it were. The curia and the pontiff mainly, and then others that are working in these offices and so on to do the work of the church, really work in the Vatican City. And when their term of employment is done, they leave. But there's no citizenship there. Now mind you, they have coins, they have money that they've minted. But no one uses it. When you go to Rome, you use Italian money. It's just a home for the bureaucracy of the Holy See, it's a, it's a pretended state. It has the rights and the privileges afforded by nations, but it's not legitimate. And if it's not legitimate, can it really claim rights and exemptions from prosecution on certain issues of violation of law, even human rights, if it does not have the actual thing? What do we going to deal with one? That's citizens. You need to have citizens. Does the Vatican City have citizens? Absolutely not. Number two, has no defined territory. You say no. It has 108 acres called the Vatican City, which encompasses the Vatican, a few buildings around it, and a huge garden. Is that enough to be an actual territory? The Vatican City is not even an actual city. Because can you have a city within a city? Can you have St. Petersburg, and I, I'm going to declare this John Coferhood? Can I do that? No. no, because number one, you can have a city within a city. You have to have your own defined territory that's not the actual allocated place and, and, and territory of another because the actual area of Rome is sovereign territory. And the Vatican City is really, by act of Mussolini, an uh, imposition on the Italian government. It doesn't even have a real separate border. Now say for instance, if you had the Roman city, city of Rome, and then you had maybe a little area cut out here that was kind of encroaching into what you saw as Rome and bordered with another nation, then maybe you might say, okay, it's small, but it's another nation. But this, the Vatican City is in, actually completely within Rome. It doesn't even legitimately stand as a separate city, much less a sovereign nation. It can't exist in within another city. Not to mention, they have no police force, no separate sewage, no hospitals. All these things are provided by the Italian police force. As a matter of fact, you go to the Vatican City and you pick someone's pocket, the Vatican police are not going to do anything to you. Italian police, police are coming. If you go and someone beats you or robs you in the Vatican City, are the Vatican police going to get involved? Vatican FBI? Are you going to a Vatican hospital? Absolutely not. You go to an Italian hospital. It is not valid, but it's believed to be so. The water you drink is Italian water, not Vatican water. When you flush the toilet, it goes into the Rome's sewer system, not the Vatican's. It has no sovereign entity in of itself except for the rights afforded by the Lateran Treaty. And again, you have to have all four We've already destroyed two. So let's go on to number three. Let's have a legitimate government. Number three, Montevideo Conference said you have to have a government. Is there a le legitimate government? Well, if you have no citizens and no territory, how can you really have a government? 
Even if you claim to have people there, who are you governing if you have no citizens? Maybe, maybe it's only making sense to me. You can't govern if you have no citizens. And no real territory, what are you really governing? The whole idea of government is basically the idea that you have the Pope and the Curia. And, and mind you, you have a number of ambassadors, if you will, which we'll deal with our next section, that work and visit and meet with people in the Vatican City. But again, without citizens that you're actually receiving taxes from, per se. All the money that is received by the Vatican largely is coming from tourism as a state. Other than that, it's largely coming from all over the world, the tithes and offerings and gifts that come from the various churches internationally. No actual government. The Romish Pope and the Curia largely deal with civil matters. All the ideas of zoning, planning, all that is really largely dealt with by the Roman city government and the Italian government. Lastly, number four, the capacity to enter into diplomatic and other relations with other states. When you talk about entering into diplomatic relations with other states, it means having ambassadors, having consulates, having embassies. Again, if you went to the Vatican City or you went to go to visit Rome on a vacation and someone uh, beat and kidnapped you, would your parents call and try to contact the American embassy in the Vatican to see if they can get you back? There is no American embassy in the Vatican. There are no embassies, even though this is supposedly a state, there's no embassies in the Vatican for America, for Russia, and so on. However, the Vatican has ambassadors to virtually every nation and is in diplomatic relations with various nations. And they have special envoys that deal directly with the Vatican, but not in a residence in Vatican City. When you go to Washington, D.C., there is the French uh, uh, consulate, there's the Russian consulate, there's the uh, Portuguese consulate, there's the, I mean, every nation you could think of has a consulate, a place that's inviolable. You can't just run up inside there. They have diplomatic immunity. And these places are in America, in Washington, D.C., and even you have some places down here, even down here in Florida, you have certain embassies for various nations in major cities. But the papacy only has diplomats going all these places doing the work of extending the power of Rome, building more concordats, more treaties with nations to get its power increased. Where is the actual diplomacy? Where are the consulates? Where are the embassies? Can we say it really doesn't exist? And if it doesn't exist, and by international law, the idea of having a Vatican state is not valid, then how valid is the Latin Treaty? And the Latin Treaty does not have real power and has not really given the papacy anything and has not really made a legitimate state. How can she try to avoid prosecution for various issues that we're going to deal with even right now, which is number two. Number two, apologies. What is the papacy trying to be exempt from by saying it's a state, it has the right to avoid prosecution and so on and so forth? It has diplomatic immunity. And its priests have largely diplomatic immunity. This is something that's been battled back and forth. But apologies. You ever heard any apologies made by popes over the last, for some of you are pretty young, 10 years, five years, two years? Yes. When the pope just went to visit the Walden Seas, did, wasn't there apologies for unchristlike things that were done or said toward the Walden Seas. What are those unchristlike things? Yeah. Wasn't it religious persecution? Yeah. Wasn't that human rights violations? Aren't these things chronicle and uncontroverted? Is there is this some kind of question? Is it a myth? Or is it documented fact 
that human rights violations were perpetrated by the Catholic Church against the Waldenses as a people and as a religious order. Because you have the people that were in the Waldensian mountain, and you have the religion of the Waldenses, right? The Waldensian church. So you have human rights violation, you have on one side, you have genocide on the other, and then you have uh, religious persecution all in one. All these things the Pope apologized for, right? During the 90s, I believe it is, Pope John Paul II apologized for slavery. And people were like, what? Apologize? People are like dumbfounded, like what? What is it? But again, it's kind of maybe did on a Friday. You know, back in those days, you know, we had a new cycle ended on Friday. Weekend came, they forgot about it. It's long gone. A part of for slavery? What? 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 Why are you part of for slavery? Well, got brushed under the news, kind of went away. But again, why would the Pope apologize for slavery? Well, many people don't know. That in the 1400s, the papacy issued a bull, basing basically divvying up the world into two parts. One part went to Portugal, one part went to Spain. And by divvying up the world by this papal bull, they gave the right to establish the slave trade, using West Africans as a workforce to colonize and to explore, build, have dominion over the quote-unquote new world. To this day, in the island of Cape Verde, the slave bloc established in the mid-1500s still exists, where untold millions of African slaves were sold and put on ships and sailed across the Middle Passage to America and to the Caribbean, to Trinidad, to Jamaica, to Dominica, to Dominican Republic, to Haiti. That's called genocide, brothers and sisters. That's called human trafficking. Is it not? But you said that's a long time ago. And they apologized for it. What about the Inquisition? Oh, it's a long time ago. They apologized for those things. But my question is, and my, my point is that we want to think about from a religious liberty standpoint and making a case. Again, remember the individual I talked about in my example who was in jail? Coming out from a parole? If I apologize for slavery or creating the slave trade by religious um, tolerance. If I foment and exacerbate genocide, human trafficking, human rights violations, civil rights violations, religious liberty violations, yet I keep the theological ideological and hierarchical framework in place that exacerbated it, have I truly changed? In other words, if the papacy claims that they apologize for all these abuses of human rights, civil rights, fomenting genocide, but the same theology that caused them to think they had the right to and gave them the ability to and also says they cannot make a mistake is still in place. The same hierarchical structure that was in existence in the time of this series of events, if you want to call them, is still in place. The same ideological framework is still in place. How can you say that you truly have changed? Because if time and circumstance were reversed and we were in an environment where the papacy had the ascendancy again, the same hierarchical, ideological, and theological framework would again accomplish the same genocide, the same human rights violation, the same human trafficking, the same civil and religious rights <laughs> abuses because the framework and the machinery is for a purpose. Let me give you an example. If I have a instrument of torture, let's use a broad example. If I have an instrument of torture, and or I say I have a whole host of instruments of torture. Basically, I say I have a whole dungeon full of instruments of torture. You name it, all the historical issues. The rack is there, the Iron Maiden, uh, uh, 
bed of nails, uh, I mean, just all the various different torture implements that were used during the Dark Ages, they are in a dungeon. But I say, you know what? It's a museum. It's a museum. You know, I'm a scholar and I believe that we should keep these antiquities because we can't ignore the past and keep these antiquities and, you know, make sure that people remember what happened here. So they're all placed. And I keep them in good condition because I don't want them to deteriorate because I want the people to be able to see these things. But while I'm holding this museum and keeping these things in good working condition for science sake, for science sake of course, keeping them in good condition for science sake and for the sake of history, I also have the same theology that caused me to see need of having and using these things. I still hold the same views of what heresy is that would cause me, if I had civil power, to need, punish, heretics and also ideologically I believe that this is the only way that you can have a true legitimate world order under this power when those situations come to pass what happens to that museum? What happens to that museum? It becomes a terror it becomes a killing, a killing field again. So my question to you brothers and sisters Again, when we talk about this idea of apologies, what truly is an apology worth when the same methods and instruments, as you will, uh, theologically now, you might say, well, we don't have to, uh, guillotine and so on anymore, but if you still had the same issues and principles and theology that caused the whole world about you before, still in place, what changes if you have that deadly wound healed? What changes if you now have civil power? Because again, when that 1798 issue came up, that event happened in 1798, and you lost your civil power with all the nations, then you start making these, these different overtures toward the nation. But again, you didn't change your theology. You didn't change your hierarchy. You didn't change your, ide your ideological way of seeing the world and the need of re-establishing yourself in the world. Your whole emphasis has been getting back to that power again, and if you get to that power again, what changes between pre-1798 and now? Nothing. Because the same theology is in place, the same hierarchy is in place, the same idea of how the world should be run, and who has the right to speak and not speak, and give rights, and who has the power of heaven, hell, and the underworld? Who has the keys of this blood? Let's close with the last thought before we have a few moments of rest for tonight as we close out with the Sabbath. People will say, well, you know, they don't have the same theology, same ideological stands in the world. Haven't you heard of Vatican II? Vatican II in the 60s, Vatican II came about and they came forward with a new idea for the church. It breathed a breath of fresh air. We don't do the Roman Mass anymore. We don't do the Mass in Latin anymore. We do it in English language. We've changed. We've changed. We have an idea of ecumenism that has now breathed new life into the church. We are more interested in celebrating. The idea of celebration is central. Now, it may be tangential, but you know, the, the, you know what it was called when you actually burned a heretic at the stake? You know what it was called in Portuguese? A celebrado. The actual the act of burning a heretic was called a celebrado. It was called a celebration. So, the idea of celebrating in this time of weakness can easily change when civil power is attained. The idea of ecumenism and bringing all together can easily change when the woman rides the beast. When she's calling a Uber, she has to be humble, right? But when she rides the beast, the idea of coming together is convert or die. You see, let's put it this way, we're talking about Vatican II. Before Vatican II, let's just bring us up to Vatican II. Before Vatican II, you have what's called the Lateran Treaty in, in the year 1929. About 40 years later you had, well, 30 years later you had Vatican II. When the Latin Treaty was signed, we were in the midst of the uptake to World War II. Mussolini was in place, Hirohito was in place, 
uh, Hitler was in place. And also you had what was called the hidden Fuhrer or the hidden Fuhrers, which were also sympathetic nation states that also were part of this Axis power, even though they weren't the Axis, the, the three. You had the Jap Japanese, you had the Germans, you had the, the Italians. That three was the Axis, but then you had other powers like Yugoslavia, right? Onto Ante Pevelek. Ever heard of Ante Pevelek? Never heard of him, huh? There's a reason why you haven't heard of him. How about the Perones in Argentina? Never heard of the, the play or the song, very song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina? It was, it was about the Perones. The Perones were brutal dictators, husband and wife, Catholic leaders that, as a matter of fact, when you study about the rat lines that were established after World War II, there's something called the rat lines where basically many thousands of war criminals escaped from Germany to Central and South America and the Caribbean. Through what's called the rat lines, a, lo a series of Red Cross travel documents, fortified, forwards of course, convents, monasteries, churches, and boats transferring people to Argentina where the Perones were, to various countries in the Caribbean and so on to escape the war crimes tribunals. People like Joseph Mengele, the doctor of death and various other people, I, you know, Eichmann, all these people that were famous war criminals escaped into Central and South America through these rat lines. Who ran the rat lines? The Catholic Church. In connection and in the tolerance of the USA and so on and so forth, but still, a lot of these war criminals were either shifted down the rat lines away from the war tribunal or they were absorbed into America's space program and so on and so forth and that way escaped persecution. It's all history. You can just read about rat lines. It's nothing that's secret. But again, tying the, the evidence together. All this that happened after 1929 and this Latin Treaty being signed that we're going to talk about now for a few seconds deals with an idea of what happens as soon as the papacy receives power. 1798 brought an end to its power. 1929 shows it's receiving its power to rule and have sovereignty again. There's a book called Hitler's Pope. It came out in early 2000. I think 2008 if I'm not mistaken. Hitler's Pope by a man by the name of John uh, Cornwell. Catholic scholar and writer. And in this book he basically was able to go into archives and, and actually prove that the Pope during the time of World War II ignored evidence and refused to speak against Hitler. As a matter of fact, he was instrumental in signing the Concordat with Germany that brought sanction to and power to the Catholic Church in connection with Hitler, the, the Nazi government. They were in collusion through this Concordat. They were in agreement, just like that a Concordat with Italy, that a Concordat with the Catholic Church. Now this book was a firestorm when it came out. But it point by point shows evidence that when the Catholic Church came to power and got its sovereignty back, it immediately started making concordats with these, we know, war criminals. These nations that were, at, at, were on the verge of genocide, human rights abuses, civil rights abuses, everything that the papacy was doing during the Dark Ages these powers about to do. They immediately signed concordance with powers, civil powers, that were doing and were to do the same work they did during the Dark Ages. What were the main people that killed, died during the Holocaust? Jews. And when you look at, especially the one that you seem to didn't know about, the hidden Fuhrer named Ante Pavlik, look at and study into the history of Yugoslavia during World War II. And study about Ante Pavlik and how the Eustachi army would travel in and go to the countryside with nuns and priests marching ahead. And they would travel and come into a village and gather all the people together. And they were told in their language, either you convert or die. And those that refused to convert, they would gather them together, dig a pit, shoot them, cover them up. 
And say again, who's going to convert or die? Then everyone else that was scared, they would come together and they would have mass, they would sprinkle them as Catholics, have prayer, make a sign of a cross, dig a pit, shoot them, cover them, and go into another city. So really it was convert and die, actually. People were brutalized, massacred, and these things are actually recorded. If you ever go to Europe again, and you actually have an opportunity to go to Yugoslavia, go to the museums in Yugoslavia and see they have pictures of Antipavlak's desk. He had a desk full of Serbian eyeballs where they would go and remove the eyeballs from men, women and children and send them back because they wanted their eyeballs. Pictures of individuals that were priests offering mass by day and soldiers by night. People doing all kinds of War crime, not only war crime, war crimes against humanity, genocide, the destruction, almost genocide of the Serbian people during that time. So much so that they were looking for Antipavlet, who again escaped with his wife down the rat lines out of Europe. Now, what's interesting about that, we don't have time to really go into all that. We didn't with Vatican II. When Antipavlet died, he received a requiem mass. You know what a requiem mass is? A requiem mass is the highest mass that can be given to someone who is not a priest or a pope. It's only given to those who are soldiers and champions of the faith. And this was given to Antipavlik, war criminal, who was in favor of the largely Catholic armies and people that he represented who were wiping out in genocide the Serbians who largely were Protestant, non-Catholics. This is what happened in Yugoslavia. You know what happened in Germany. Similar things happened in Italy. As soon as the papacy resigned the Latin Treaty, all these powers that they were in league with went into these forms of Papal persecutions of ancient times. These are the people that they were in league with. Is there guilt by association? And as soon as the Axis powers failed to conquer and dominate the world, within a few short years, Vatican II comes around. I'm going to give you some background of Vatican II. And Vatican II's purpose was the re-evangelization of the world. Why the term re-evangelization? Because they at one time had control of the world. And something happened to cause them to lose that evangelistic status or, or position. What happened to the Catholic Church's evangelizing? I use that word loosely. Because persecution, genocide, human rights abuses, and colonizing peoples for their gold and silver and so on and their physical labor is not evangelism. But nevertheless, what interrupted the evangelistic efforts of the papacy besides the deadly wound in 1798? Something starts with a P. Protestantism. The purpose of Vatican II is to re-evangelize the world and to gain back all that it lost to Protestantism. Now again, if indeed Vatican II's idea is the spirit of ecumenism and open and free dialogue, that's what they claim. The idea of celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating the Eucharist, celebrating the idea of uh, Christ with new types of music, non latern mass and so on. All these things, basically these things were not issued by the, pe by the Pope in cathedral, in the chair. These things were voted and suggested as methods of evangelism. The Pope never changed any, there's no paper book changing the church from what it was to this. It's a suggested guideline that they're using to give a Proverbs 6, 5 and verse 6, that changeable ways, lest you ponder them. A changeable look to the world that's more fitting in this secular age. They saw way in the future, saw this secular age coming, and we're going to try and foment the secularism. Free love, drugs, rock and roll, pluralism, the rise and the prominence of Eastern religions and their exercise and so on. All this and higher education, so-called, 
the, the principles of the French Revolution and those things would cause the whole world to be secularized and they saw ahead we have to try and get ahead of free speech and control it. We need to get ahead of the liberalism and create new funky groovy types of worship to try and get ahead of that aid and trying to bring this into the churches and by uniting with them and encouraging them in these things create a system of destruction of Protestant principles because when Protestant principles are destroyed what rises to the top? Catholicism. Because she is the pantheon of all gods. The only thing that can destroy Catholicism is, is Protestant, true Protestantism. The principles, the people, and the gospel of it. If Protestantism can be destroyed, Catholicism rises to the top. And we talk about Vatican II, the idea that this re-evangelization is necessary and there's a need to undo all that Protestantism has done cause us to have this last thought before we close. What has Protestantism done, or Protestantism done, that the papacy wants to undo? Think about that. Because this is the, this is the crux of the argument that we must place in making a case against the papacy in our last thought. It's taking me like two minutes. What has Protestantism done that the papacy wants to undo? If we truly have a power, the papacy, the Vatican Church, the Catholic Church, saying they want to undo or to re-evangelize the world away from this Protestant era back to this Catholic, you can call it celebration if you want to, era, what is really to undo Protestantism? Because what did we receive from Protestantism? Religious and civil liberty, is it not? Yeah. What preceded Protestantism? Inquisitorial justice, the Iron Maiden, the Rack, system of spies, a lack of, of sovereignty in your or, or uh, a right of inviability in your home. You were not secure in your person, in your effects, in your mind. You had no freedom of speech. You had no freedom of travel. You had no freedom of conscience in this inquisitorial age of ancient Europe. The idea of free speech, freedom of expression, free uh, religion, freedom of conscience came because of Protestantism and it changed the landscape of Europe and the whole world. This is what Protestantism gave to the world in connection with the gospel and the hope of salvation and a citizenry anywhere the gospel took root and Protestantism took root, a citizenry that were upright and moral and righteous because righteous exalted the nation but sinners were reproached to any people. So again, what are we moving away from if the idea of Vatican II, no matter how high the plateaus are, what are we really moving away from if we are re-evangelizing the world away from protestantism, away from civil and religious liberty, away, away from freedom of speech, away from the idea that you are to be secure in your person, in your possessions. You have a right to own property. You have a right to dissent. All these things did not exist largely where the papacy held sway in state. And the Protestant era moved the whole pendulum of the Western society away from civil through kings and religious through popes, tyranny. So no matter how nice, how smooth it's all, how, how sweet as a honeycomb you make it, if you're trying to undo what Protestant has done, where are you really going? And how is that a disaster for civil and religious liberty? Again, we're making a case against the papacy in a digital age. Let's close with GC 566 as we close our last statement. GC 566, let's just read it. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. May God help us to understand some of these points to flesh them out because we're told that there will be a people that will lay the sins of Babylon open, but most people don't even know what those sins are. She'll be unmasked. Unmasked, her ways are changeable. People don't know that she has a mask on. They don't know what's underneath, and they don't know how to take it off. But there's a people that will understand how 
how to give the trumpet a certain sound. I pray that it will be among those in this room, as well as those that hear this word, these words as far as they may go. Let's pray together on that wise. Father, again, as we think about these things, we pray for your divine grace. You said to spend your arrows, shoot your arrows at Babylon. But Lord, where are these arrows that hit a sure place? Where are these arrows? And, and from what bow shall we bend them on? The NIV? The various different translations that have no strength to take any arrow quickly, nor can even hold an arrow. Oh Lord, help us to understand the terrible, perilous times that we're in and make preparation to meet Jesus in peace. We see all around us the sign that what we know as society and civilization here in this country and all across Western Europe is crumbling. The idea of peace and safety is being promoted, but we see dark clouds on the horizon. Help us make preparation in our hearts, in our homes, in our spiritual understanding of truth. For we ask it in Jesus' name, and we thank Thee. Amen.